All right, everyone, as you can see on your agenda, we have entitled <coughs> this panel discussion with a very lukewarm little title, Is Academic Freedom in Crisis? And uh, I want to second what my colleague just said, that we, we are here today because we really do feel that active, engaged boards are essential to addressing this issue, the issue of cost, the issue of quality, you name it, um, that uh, at the end of the day, it's the boards of trustees and the fiduciaries who are going to have to uh, ensure that students receive a rigorous education at an affordable cost and that we cannot regrettably rely on the internal constituencies to make these changes. It has to be done from those who are informed on the outside. So uh, that is uh, one of the reasons we brought together these incredible experts today. And what we have done is we have asked uh, each one of them to think about this topic in advance. I'm going to have each one talk about five minutes uh, to the question, is academic freedom in crisis? And then we'll open it up to uh, questions and answers. Uh, one of the things that I have, uh, that we've asked the panelists to think about is not only what are the challenges, what are the problems, which we outline obviously in the book, but really where do we go from here? What are the steps? What can trustees do? What can other educational leaders do? What can legislatures do when it comes to these issues of a quality education where students are really apprised of uh, multiple perspectives and able to uh, make the kinds of decisions that we need for an educated polity? So with that, let me turn it over to Neil, have you uh, uh, start the, the conversation? And, uh, take it from there. Well, thanks, Ann. Uh, Okay, I do have a handout here, so I'm going to have Ann uh, give that to you. We may, we may not get to that in this five minutes, but uh, I'm sure it'll come up repeatedly this afternoon. But this is about the, the handout's about the acculturation of professors into the ethics of the profession. Uh, if we just step back, uh, so in about 18 months, it'll be the 100th anniversary of the, 2000, of the uh, 1915 Declaration. Uh, I mean, I've just proposed the group, uh, think about revisit, you know, some sort of a document on re revisiting the, two the uh, 1915 Declaration and uh, what looks different. We've already been talking about, about that, uh, John mentioned, because uh, the, the, the current attacks are coming from inside the academy, whereas the, two, the, the uh, 1915 Declaration is all directed as if all the attacks were coming from outside. So what do we do in this new world? Uh, like uh, we got a lot of veteran academics in the audience. I, this is a rhetorical question, but would you agree that essentially, on our watch anyway, uh, <coughs> we are assuming that the acculturation of new entrants and veterans in the profession is occurring through some sort of osmosis-like diffusion from veterans to the junior people and among the veterans? I think that probably was true in the 1915 period and also the 1940 <coughs> period, but we've just got a dramatic change in the profession since that time. All of the other professions, including business, have moved to a much more aggressive acculturation of new uh, entrants uh, in formal instruction, except, I mean, the only, uh, unfortunately, the mother of all the professions, the uh, academic profession, does almost nothing except for uh, responsible conduct of research, that, and that's because of the federal government pressure. So essentially, I, I, my theme is going to be uh, we're basically, we're getting what you'd expect when there's a total failure of acculturation and what you'd expect, and this would be true of the business people in the room. If you're running a fairly large enterprise and you totally fail to acculturate your people into the uh, code of ethics of the company, you totally fail to acculturate them into some sort of a compliance mentality and then a preventive law mentality, possibly a risk management mentality, and perhaps even beyond that the code of ethics goes beyond that into some uh, business ethics. Well, if you totally fail, then you would expect you're going to have fires all the time. And that's what we have in higher education. You've got fires going on all the time. And that's, if you look at the recommendations at the end of your document, uh, I would describe all of them except the last one, which is let's educate. We are educators. Let's educate, not just professors, but also boards and the other stakeholders. Uh, then all the others fall into place. They are just fires that you'd expect from a total failure of any acculturation uh, into the ethics of the profession. So my background for the last 
27 years I've focused on the ethics of the professions and how do we acculturate new entrants and veterans both into the floor ethics. I'm going to disagree with uh, <coughs> one of the uh, commentators earlier. It's not just about the floor. Are they into law compliance? In all the professions, there's an ethics above the floor. Who are we? What are the ideals and core values of the profession? <coughs> are we trying to, over a career, live into those core values of the profession? They have a lot to do with responsibility for others and self. And so there's something above the law. Just law compliance, in my view, is not enough for a uh, profession, including business. Uh, so uh, from 1986 on, I've been teaching the required course in ethics, and then I've been experimenting. This is in law now. And then uh, at about two 19, uh, 1990, I got into academic ethics, tried to help create a field of academic ethics up till 2005, uh, tried everything I could think of with all the national organizations, including AAUP, and that totally failed. So about 2006, I threw in the towel on academic ethics and decided, you know, two books, 20 articles, ball went nowhere, what am I doing? So I, since 2006 till today, Holleran Center, the center I direct, we're much more focused on the intersection of uh, ethics with medicine. So I, we, we do a lot with Mayo Clinic, which is putting a staggering amount of money into professionalism. Uh, and I am moving our money over to working with a new group out of uh, Colorado, Denver, the University of Denver called Educating Tomorrow's Lawyers, a consortium of 27 schools committed to this new effort. And this summer, we're, in that we're launching, if you think of the most successful movement on our watch, it's Law and Economics and the clinics. But Law and Economics did it through workshops for professors and judges. So we're launching this summer a series of eight workshops with four professors from each school, bringing in six schools at a time to introduce what would it look like? What would a, an engagement of professors look like where you were actually moving towards the ethics beyond just <coughs> the rules and, not, and in law. So that's our new uh, paradigm shift is basically what I'm trying to see what we can do. That's the new effort. Uh, I could go through the history of the various professions that haven't attended to, their, to this acculturation process, the accountants, the priests, lawyers, the Sarbanes-Oxley, and now professors. Clearly you see with this data, 30% of us tenured the data you have on page 92 through 93 and page 75, a decrease in public trust in the social contract. So it's everything that you'd expect to happen <coughs> when a profession gives up on acculturation into its own ethics. So uh, maybe I'll leave it here. Okay. Yeah. No, thank you. Uh, <laughs> I have five minutes. I've never spoken in five minutes or less. It's a violation of my academic freedom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me start with sort of a disclaimer. Um, or, Ortega once said, life is crisis. And we're always in crisis. So is academic freedom in crisis? Yes. It always has been. Uh, there is no golden age. Uh, maybe I'm a pessimist. I was born in Canada. <laughs> uh, maybe one explanation. Uh, as Neil writes about in his book, he talks about the different periods of zealotry uh, when it comes to the academy. And I'm reminded of social psychology research, a book by a guy named George, oh, I forget his name now. Uh, called Moments of Madness. It sort of traces periods in societies where we get pry into periods of sort of temporary madness or zealotry. And one thinks of the daycare center prosecutions in the 1980s, 1990s that go through their dinners as written about. Hysteria. We've had hysteria on campus at various times. Uh, Gary Wells, in speaking of the recovery covered movement, of, excuse me, the recovered memory movement, uh, said that the biggest superstition of our age is that there's no longer superstition. And I think that applies to the academy. Uh, the era of political correctness is the latest stage of that, or has been. Uh, there was a period between the 60s when you had a different kind of zealotry uh, and uh, the 1990s when PC really began. Uh, 1975 to 1985, the period of, of normality. Uh, I was at Berkeley at the time, and you could actually have an honest conversation about affirmative action on either side of that issue. Uh, and then starting in the mid-80s, that became really, really hard because of various groups that started organizing on campus, et cetera. So uh, in one sense, Ecclesiastes reigns. There's nothing new under the sun. Uh, on the other hand, I'm a bit of an Ecclesiastes revisionist. And uh, I think there are some reasons for uh, more pessimism now as well as hope. Each period, was uh, that uh, 
Holy Story said about families, uh, each happy family is sort of alike, each unhappy family is unhappy for its own distinctive reasons. And so it's a combination of uh, similarity and difference. Uh, first of all, there are ideological aspects to our recent problems that I think are new. Uh, I was at a conference in 2006 in Washington, D.C., a David Horowitz's Student Bill of Rights. Uh, he wanted to recruit people for the movement. I refused for reasons I'll talk about, though uh, I have respect for Horowitz in many ways. I refused to join that movement. But Philip uh, Stephen Thurstrom from Harvard spoke. And as you probably know, he ran into trouble at Harvard because of his teaching a class that students said should be taught by an African American, not by a white. And uh, he said that when he first came to Harvard in the 1960s, uh, he didn't even know the political affiliation of his colleagues because it just wasn't on the radar screen. Nobody really cared. <coughs> and you compare that to you know, what has happened since then, uh, the movement toward much more ideological conformity on campus, uh, et cetera. Uh, Pew Center has done research on political donations. 2004, Big Ten University's faculty, I don't need to ask me what you think, nine to one in favor of Kerry over Bush. My campus, 99 to one at one point. And UCLA has also done surveys on uh, faculty political ideology. Now, I sometimes think we make too much of that. Uh, there's more difference at major universities than you think. But still, it's a problem. And if you're surrounded by people that sort of think the same way you do about these issues, uh, you're going to become like a fish in water. They don't know they're in water. And uh, I've definitely seen that happen in a variety of uh, areas. In addition, uh, we've seen the rise of what uh, is, uh, Frederick Lynch, I think his first name is Frederick, calls the diversity machine, uh, in which you have administrators, or now national networks, you know, the issue that Fire talked about at the University of Delaware, uh, orientation, brainwashing of students, et cetera. That was all part of the national movement and infrastructure of administrators that were sort of pushing this agenda, and we had uh, faculty that were not willing to oppose it or maybe didn't care. So uh, I think we have entered a kind of new era, uh, but maybe it's sort of, you know, what Hegel talked about, the owl and the nerva flying at dusk. Uh, we're entering a new era uh, in which there might be uh, different kinds of issues, especially having to do with economics. And as I mentioned in my commentary, uh, the economic crisis that we face in the West, as well as at universities, uh, could be an opportunity more for people to press us on our social obligations, the obligation side of the social contract out of which academic freedom uh, arose. So in a positive sense, this is a time to pressure and re-examine, uh, reopen the door to the outside world when we don't take care of our own business. And we haven't done that, both in terms of supporting academic freedom, which is the first responsibility of academic freedom, to support it, and also in terms of acknowledging its proper limits and responsibilities. Uh, and uh, as Herbert Stein once wrote, if something's unsustainable, it's not going to last. It just takes a long time for universities to uh, change, partly because of the way tenure set up and, and uh, things like that. But I also worry about will the outside world um, properly understand what universities are about. Uh, we've already talked about some cases where uh, politicians push their own agendas threaten to defund when academic freedom is being honored on campus uh, because it's a protected group that they don't like. And I've noticed that Wisconsin in a very clear way, and I'm sure it applies elsewhere, a decline in the humanities. Now, on one hand, mea culpa, as we all know. Uh, they brought it on themselves. They're becoming politicized. Uh, but also, there's less appreciation for that out there in the real world. Uh, more and more parents at Wisconsin, I hear this from advisors who talk to them all the time, they don't want their children taking or their, their, their children taking electives. It's a waste of money. The debt the un, uh, with an unclear job market, more and more people are concerned about efficiency. And for better or worse, the humanities are the basis for teaching our political freedoms in this country. So not only have humanities sort of abandoned their obligation, but it seems to me more and more people in the outside world are frowning on humanities. So I think that's a problem for us uh, in the long run as well. And finally, uh, we still have the problem of universities lacking community. The economic crisis is going to make that worse. 
We have more adjunct professors, as Benno has pointed out, or adjunct faculty, uh, who will have less institutional loyalty. But institutional loyalty has already been at risk uh, with entrepreneurial research, which I applaud in many ways, but too many faculty members are no longer committed to the institution as a community. And the, the community is where the principles of academic freedom are embodied. And uh, so that's, I think, an issue uh, we have to contend with in the future uh, as well. And uh, people have talked about Tocqueville. I'll conclude by talking about Tocqueville, <coughs> like everybody else. Um, Tocqueville's notion of political freedom was based on the right kind of community. Uh, he said excessive individualism <coughs> is like an asset. And yet Tocqueville also said, in the past I was prepared to defend freedom, given the modern condition of equality of condition, I'm prepared to worship it. He worshiped freedom, but he understood that freedom has to be linked to a community that gives it the proper kind of support. He called it political freedom, not just isolated individual freedom. Uh, entrepreneurial researchers are individuals, not tied to the institution. Adjuncts are unavoidably going to be the same kind of way. So we have to find a way to put Humpty, back, Humpty Dumpty back together again without sacrificing what it was supposed to be about. And I think it's going to be a tough task. So I'd like to focus, I'd like to focus on one aspect of this, really the problem of morality and power. In particular, faculty misconduct and federal power. Faculty misconduct in research is obviously a very serious problem. But federal power over that misconduct is also a serious problem. And my goal today is simply to observe that I cannot address the one without worrying about the other. The substantive difficulty concerns what faculty do in their research. You know, when should a professor refuse research funding? When should she report it as a conflict of interest? As Justice Wyatt said, what can she do to recommend subjects? How far can she go? And what information must she keep confidential? And so forth. It's almost endless list. But the substantive question, what is misconduct, is only the first step. Um, there's always a second question about power. Who decides what a professor can do? Individual professors? Or perhaps the university? Or the federal government? Currently, the primary response comes from the federal government. The federal government regulates research, both directly and through conditions. And either way, the government requires universities to carry out its federal policies. And as a result, universities end up acting as agents, government agents, to police research. I use the word government agent or federal agent and police with good reason. So my question is simply, is this the right approach? Is this really the best way to deal with this difficulty? The danger is that federal power will not quite prevent academic misconduct while almost certainly stifling academic freedom. The danger is accentuated by very broad conceptions of faculty misconduct. The government requires universities to control mis misconduct that is not really misconduct. The government asks universities to regulate transfers of medical information under HIPAA. It requires them to regulate human subjects' research. And I was just talking to a guest looking at uh, human beings and their common rules. And it asks them to regulate conflicts of interest, which may be simply getting together with someone else and having them go to lunch and trying to find a lobby to eat. And thus, in exercising control, the government burdens perfectly innocent research. The danger is further accentuated by the federal policy of prevention. No state merely offers remedies after harm has occurred. The law doesn't interfere until there's been a harm. But federal research policy aims at prevention, and it therefore imposes controls prior to the harm. And this means prior licensing. The faculty need permission for what they do, for what they read, for what they say, for what they put forth as public. And inevitably, this licensing stifles much valuable research before it even begins. For example, consider two licensing examples. First, the HIPAA privacy rule, which governs transfers of medical information, delaying it profoundly, sometimes for the detriment of patients, sometimes for the detriment of science. And then there's the regulation of human subjects' research under the common rule. Universities enforce these licensing regimes 
are requiring faculty to get prior permission for much of their inquiry and publication, including an inquiry and publication that is not funded by the federal government, and including an inquiry and publication that involves merely words, reading, talking, printing. The regulations thereby stop some misconduct. Undoubtedly, that's true, but mostly, mostly they inhibit innocent research and publication, lest it be containing things that are private or sensitive or offensive. I want to close these very brief remarks by surveying the resulting lawsuit just so we know what's at stake. And at first, there's an individual one, free school academic freedom, a loss in the freedom in doing research. It's no longer spontaneous or even easy. And there's even a loss of free speech and publication. And I mean that in the constitutional sense, and there probably will be litigation. And if you're on, if you're associated with a state university, don't be anywhere near them. We really do not want that because it'll be, there are violations of civil liberties here against this very thing. Second, there's an institutional one, and that's university liability. Academics enjoy freedom to the extent they're independent agents, for example, in the conduct of their research. But when universities control faculty research, they reduce faculty and university autonomy. And if federal demands for university control over research, that can ensure that universities will be held liable for faculty misconduct. University control guarantees university liability. And it has been a profound strategic error by university council. University council are not looking at public council. University council has put a fixed term, just that. They have sent that power to open court. And the result here is the very term will be this very late cycle. And so they're not looking ahead. And as a result, universities have moved in with this strategic error. They're no longer free and they're gonna be held accountable. And then third, and that's what I wanna focus on in closing, there's a societal one, which is the erosion of trust. The federal solution for research misconduct includes vast amounts of valuable research and vast amounts of scientific publication. And if you think this is just you know, perhaps okay where they put the word like arm up there in sci medical science, think again, 90% of new drugs and devices come out of the United States. That's changing and with good reason. We have a lot to do before the Americans get here too. This loss in science actually has a body count. I think about Vietnam in the daily body count. Um, there is a body count here and it is daily. Every year, it's easier to count by years, every year it's like thousands, even tens of thousands of lives. I can prove the tens of thousands. It probably runs much higher than that. And everyone in this room will read it 40 years, of course, because a lot of folks' medicine study time will also run about this. On the one hand, there's no evidence that research is distinctively dangerous. There's no scientific evidence that, e that anything is more dangerous when done in research than when done outside of research nor is there any scientific evidence that fe federal regulation saves lives. None, what, no evidence whatsoever. And I tried to prove that its regulation saved lives in the mid-90s and then realized the data was so poor and it gave up and it didn't do any more research on that. On the other hand, there is an ocean of evidence about the loss of scientific knowledge and that it ensures a loss of lives. The loss of a single experiment can cost 10 to 20,000 lives a year. It can be illustrated nicely by the Perry Nobel study in Michigan bunch of those lists. The NIH says it could be about 20,000 losses there, probably more like 10, but who counts? Who knows? Indeed, the loss of life from federal and university controls is exponential because each suppressed experiment delays further experiments, thus slowing the pace of change overall. So even if the federal regulations do save some lives each year, can't prove it, but let's just take it for granted, this cannot justify stifling science, thereby stifling many, many thousands of lives. And of course, you go beyond the United States to Africa, the loss is even greater. In sum, there are real problems um, in research misconduct, but the initial substantive question about the misconduct doesn't resolve the next question about power, and federal power over research is lessened. particularly emphasize the fact that there's just a lack of industry. There is no corporation, there is no education in terms of professional responsibilities and that we perceive that to be the, the first step 
in order to go about bringing back the correlative rights and responsibilities that we see in the in the nineteen fifteen statement that said i think particularly to boards of trustees understanding exactly what academic freedom is properly perceived is very hard so if i could ask all three of you simply to answer this fundamental question is academic freedom a right or a privilege and how does it differ from first amendment rights to freedom of speech and association because i think that's a fundamental baseline understanding that's missing in so many places i'd like for you all to speak to that Um, well i'm i'm going to just repeat the position of academic freedom i think it's rally to form the ACP <coughs> and to come up with the 1915 declaration. So there you see the professoria mobilizing. I think coming out of the uh, fact they'd organized as disciplines into a national uh, organization. I, I don't really like right privilege sort of arguments. I think that really uh, <coughs> rights are always sort of, you know, freedom always comes with duty. <laughs> These are fundamental mm-hmm. principles. So whether it be one of the variation ones or whatever. The professors, if you read that 1915 declaration, they're saying we claim right for the public good, and the right they claimed was remember they're operating out of an employment law tradition here where the employer controls speech. They're saying we claim a right to autonomy and speech. More actually, as it turns out, more vocational freedom of expression than any <coughs> other occupation in the world uh, from the board employer power or the administrator's employer power, but we are promising in return that each professor will meet his or her duties of competence and ethical conduct as a professor, and we are promising as a collegial group to monitor each other. The other professors are doing the same thing. The lawyers claim the same thing. The doctors claim the same thing. Uh, The accountants claim the same thing. I've known professors fail, and then they got Sarbanes-Oxley and got federalized principally in terms of their over the, uh, the actual law of the profession. Lawyers are going to, anyway, we won't go through all that. But all the professions are fighting for autonomy in here. Uh, so th- I think that's where I would, I think I answered your question. Yeah. yeah, I think it requires more thinking through and discussion, but if I had to give a definition, a succinct one, which is obviously not uh, thorough enough, uh, it's the, uh, the, the right or the privilege, I'm not gonna get into that distinction right now, to pursue the truth through professional competence, to pursue the truth through teaching and research with professional competence. So it's a special type of right that's granted. Philosophically speaking and historically speaking, in my mind, it's a tension between uh, a, what I would call a deontological, non-consequential right. Uh, this goes, you know, Alan Bloom in The Closing of the American Mind says, despite all the medieval apparatus, et cetera, the university, when all said and done, and I certainly felt this way, I was at Cornell when Bloom was there. Uh, uh, it, the university is based on Socrates. And when you look at it that way, that links me to the Declaration of Independence. Uh, it's one of the self evident rights. I'm going to have that right in my mind as a human being, whether society gives it to me or not. Okay? Uh, so that's, I would call that, 
the rights, the natural rights side. There's also the social contract side. They're linked in lock. Natural rights through the social contract become civil rights that society recognizes and that we agree to. That's our constitution. And uh, from that side, that's where the, I would call it, not the freedom side of academic freedoms, that should be there anyway, though it's constrained because of the professional contract, but also what one of the commentators points out, I forget which one it was, that the real issue with academic freedom is self-governance. It's not the freedom to speak. We have that with or without the social contract. Social contract shapes it. And it's self-governance where I think we have run astray. We're not self-governing in the way that we should be, which is opening the door to others. So to me, academic freedom as a concept is embedded between the natural right to think, to be free, and the social contract right, which comes out of history, which creates a special set of uh, institutional obligations we have as professors. Uh, so I'll just leave it at that for now. Just very quickly, uh, I can't help, on the, on the morals question, I can't help thinking that these institutions since around 1200 have been theological institutions. Briefly, they escaped that. But they're reverting back to theological institutions. The, the theology has changed. Now, what is academic freedom? One answer has been professionalism. Everybody in a quest for status. You can't get money, at least go for status. And so <laughs> academics want to say, oh, we're professionals. But they're not really professionals. Would you really entrust your body or your lawsuit or anything else of yours to an academic? And would you pay them for it? Then that's what a professional is. These aren't professionals. Uh, and that's significant legally for many reasons. And students aren't professionals. And then the other possible answer is, well, the First Amendment, the Constitution, but that only applies to government action. And so that can't be the definition either. I'd like to propose another definition, a solution to this problem, which is the law of agency. I know it's improbable and technical, but the law of agency actually, I think, explains legally what academic freedom is. You know, we are all academics, in way, we, we're all agents of our university for some purposes and not for others. And a presumption, a rebuttable presumption that one is not a university agent, that one's an independent agent, for example, in the conduct of one's research or one's political views, actually explains a lot of what's going on. It also explains a lot of the Supreme Court cases which have left space for academic opinion, but the court doesn't understand why. Intuitively, they know it. They can't explain it. I think this explains it. 